I'll be preaching on the second epistle of Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 3. This is what Paul, our patron saint, writes. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Surely we do not need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you, from you, do we? You yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts, to be known and read by all. And you show that you are a letter of Christ prepared by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Since then we have such a hope, we act with great boldness. Not like Moses, who put a veil on his face to keep the people of Israel from gazing at the end of the glory that was being set aside, but their minds were hardened. Indeed, to this very day, when they hear the reading of the Old Covenant, that same veil is still there, since only in Christ it is set aside. Indeed, to this very day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their minds, but when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And all of us, with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord as though reflected in a mirror, are being transformed into the same image, from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, the Spirit. Too much learning is driving you insane, Paul, the Roman proconsul Festus told our patron saint during his trial directions hearing in the capital of the Roman province Judea. In fact, you are out of your mind, he said. To which Paul responded, I am not out of my mind, but speaking the sober truth, and proceeded to open the mind of two men who presided over his trial to the message of Jesus Christ. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for God. Paul later puts it in his second letter to the Corinthians. The vassal king of Judea, Agrippa, was the first to suspect that Paul's sharing his learning was not an effort on Paul's part to mount a legal defense, but rather an effort to convert the two rulers to the faith that Paul had received himself. I stand here testifying to both great and small that the Messiah must suffer and that by being the first to rise from the dead, Jesus would proclaim light both to the Jews and the Gentiles. In setting out to Festus and Agrippa the story of how he came to be a believer, Paul sought to open the minds of others to the truth of his beliefs. Paul's fervor led the Jewish vassal king Agrippa to question Paul directly about his own intentions. Are you so quickly trying to persuade me to become a Christian? Agrippa asked Paul. To which Paul replied, whether quickly or not, I pray to God that not only you, but also all who are listening to me today might become such as I am, except for these chains. It did not matter whether he was chained in a courtroom or debating philosophers in a market square. Paul was ready to share his own faith with others in order to ensure that they, too, might come to share the light of faith that had so radically transformed his own life. Paul's diligence in making known the message that God seeks people from all kinds of backgrounds to come to know him and to experience the power of lives renewed through faith comes from his own conversion. He admits when he's questioned in court. He tells Agrippa and Festus how it was when traveling in pursuit of the followers of Jesus that he was stopped in his tracks by a vision of Jesus as a blazing light. At midday, your excellency, I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun shining on me, Paul testifies. That blinding light, Paul knew, was the risen Lord Jesus, who now commissioned him to open the minds and the eyes of non-Jewish people, the Gentiles, so that they may turn from darkness to light. His own testimony had been as transparent as his light-filled conversion. None of his debates or his discussions were ever held in secret. I speak freely, Paul tells, nothing is done in a corner. By being open about his intentions to bring others to faith, Paul later on is able to open the minds even of his prison warders in Rome to the beliefs that he holds. 
And I think that's an important message for us to hear as we think about how we might enable others to share in the faith that we hold ourselves. Sharing faith is personal and direct. It's a matter of personal conviction, just as it is a matter of establishing personal relationships. It's a matter of being transparent about the reasons for building and nurturing our relationships with others. Paul is passionate about others because he's passionate about faith, and he readily tells any he meets that this is so. In our epistle reading, which we have just heard, Paul tells the Corinthians that they are so closely linked to him and he to them that it is as if they were a letter written on our hearts to be known and read by all. In his own earlier persecution of the disciples of Jesus, Paul had furnished himself with letters of introduction to all the synagogues on the way to Damascus. He set out on his hate-filled mission to eradicate Christians by presenting authority received from the chief priests. Now he tells the Corinthians that it is their personal relationship to one another that commends him to them and them to him. Surely we do not need, as some do, letters of recommendation. In order to recommend the faith to others, Paul tells, we first need to be in a relationship with one another. In the same way in which Paul carries those to whom he speaks in his heart, so we too can carry those whom we seek to bring to Christ in our own hearts. Establishing such a profound connection, Paul believes firmly, is the work of God's Holy Spirit. It is the Spirit of the living God that inscribes the words of introduction into the hearts of those whom he sends to share the good news. Just as it is the same Spirit who opens the minds of those who receive the bearer of that good news. People come to faith because God's Holy Spirit opens the minds and dwells in their hearts, Paul affirms. None of the work of sharing the good news is ever our own work. It is the work of the Spirit of the living God. The same Spirit that opened the minds of the Corinthians to receive Paul's message also worked in Paul's own heart. This is why the people that he called and brought to faith are, as it were, anchored in his own heart. You yourselves are our letter, Paul writes. You're written in my heart, Paul tells the people in Corinth. You are engraved in my heart as profoundly and as lastingly as any inscription carved in stone. You're engraved by the Spirit of the living God on tablets of human hearts. What a connection between the bearer and the recipient of God's good news. Heart talks to heart when the message of Christ is shared, which is why bringing people to discipleship is so deeply personal, and we must be absolutely transparent about our own intentions. We cannot bring people to Christ by deceit, by feigning friendship or attention. We must become true friends, be truly attentive, and then pray for the Spirit of God to work in our hearts and in the hearts of our non-Christian friends. Sharing the good news is the work of God's Spirit in our lives, Paul knows, and that work is best seen when we bring God's love to the world. Opening the minds of others to the good news first requires us to become so attuned to that good news ourselves that we carry it in our own hearts, Paul tells us. The good news that Jesus transforms lives is best shared when it is both written in our hearts and shown forth through what we do in our lives. In order to highlight how much more personal, how much more immediate the influence of God's Holy Spirit is on our lives, Paul reminds the Corinthians of the covenant that God made with his people on Mount Sinai. On Mount Sinai, only one person, Moses, spoke with God face to face. Over 40 days, we read, Moses conversed with God, was given God's wisdom and his commandments. The words that Moses was given, he engraved on tablets of stone. Because Moses had stood in the radiance of God's light for 40 days, he veiled his face, which continued to shine with a heavenly brightness. Moses had to shield the people of God from his glory by wearing a veil. 
he placed a veil over his face so that the children of Israel would not look intently on the end of that fading glory, Paul's Greek reads here. Because Moses' face did not forever shine with God's glory, what remained when the light of the glory of God had faded on Moses' face were only the words inscribed on the stone tablets. And the minds of the people became as hardened as the stone tablets, Paul quipped, because the letters the people read were not engraved in their hearts, but on the tablets of stone, their faith remained something that was external, Paul suggests here. The veil that was a reminder of the fading glory of a distant God is set aside in Jesus Christ, Paul now tells, because when we turn to Christ, we are given the very Spirit of God to dwell in our hearts. And having God's Spirit dwell in our hearts is what makes faith so personal, he now tells the Corinthians. The story of the people of Israel on their 40-year 40 40 journey across the desert to the land of promise shows how quickly Moses' stone tablets were broken. In fact, even as Moses still descended from Mount Sinai, the people had created for themselves a God they could see and touch, a golden calf. The tablets therefore lasted only as long as the journey from the mountaintop because the people's hearts had already been hardened. Paul now tells the Jewish Christians in Corinth that their own faith should be radically different from that of their forebears. Where their forebears read God's law and sought to comprehend it, they themselves are guided by God's Holy Spirit. Stone tablets only lead to hardened hearts, Paul tells them. Only the living letters of the Spirit engraved on human hearts leads to living faith. Now the Lord is the Spirit, Paul affirms, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. When we turn to Christ, our minds may be open to the reality and the presence of God may encounter him directly as a liberating, transforming, constant presence in our lives. The message of Christ, Paul tells the people of Corinth, can lead to an encounter with God that is far more intimate, far more profound than even Moses' 40-day stay in God's presence on Mount Sinai. That glory might have set Moses' face ablaze with heavenly light for a period, but the light of Christ can illumine our hearts forever. For here God reveals himself not to one human being who speaks of his experience of encountering God in a rare mountaintop experience, but God reveals himself to all human beings. More so, God not only reveals himself to all, but who seeks to dwell in all believers. The indwelling of God in all human hearts sets free and transforms the entirety of human living. When we turn to Christ, all of us with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord as though reflected in a mirror are being transformed, Paul writes. We are transformed into who we truly are, people who are made in God's image, people who reflect God's image to the world, people who carry God in our hearts, people who carry God's people in our hearts. And this work of transformation is ongoing and ever-evolving. From one degree of glory to another, we are being transformed more and more into the image of God, Paul writes. Well, what does that mean for us here at St. Paul's Cathedral in Melbourne? How do we reflect God to others? How do we make sure that what we do and what we speak reflects the vision that God has for this world and for each individual to flourish and to grow? Are there habits that you might want to take up or indeed lay down in order to be more generous, more loving, more kind? more gracious to others. Pray about how you might mirror God's love to you in your own life and in your own love of others. How do we carry ourselves before God and how can we carry others in our hearts? How do we ensure that our lives of faith are nurtured and resourced? Are you open to God's presence in your lives and do you spend sufficient time with God in prayer the study of the scriptures, and receiving the sacraments? 
do you carry sufficiently for yourselves so that you can be enabled to better care for others? Pray that you may be given open hearts to bring people before God in prayer. And how do we become a letter of Christ? How do we make sure that nothing that we do is done in a corner, that our interactions are transparent and clear, that our faith is open, inviting, inclusive? How can we become the letter that Paul wrote and so share in his work as an apostle? Are there things that we need to learn or reflect on in order to be more confident in our ability to bring the good news to others? Pray that you may be given open minds as you share your faith with other people. We are to be the letters that Christ writes in the hearts to the world. It is in his letter to the Romans that Paul tells us how each of us can share in delivering the letters of Christ to the world. Paul knows that it is when we believe in our own hearts, we ourselves are made right with God, and we confess him with our testimony, we are saved. The life-giving knowledge that all who call on God shall be made right and saved will only benefit few people, Paul tells the Romans, unless we ourselves make that known. How are people to call on one of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him. When we reflect God to others, we make known his goodness and his grace. When we carry others in our hearts, we make known the love and power of God in our own lives. When we become the letters of Christ, that goodness of grace, love and power may be known, read and heard by all people. Faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through the word of Christ, Paul tells the Romans. You are a letter of Christ, written by the Spirit of the living God on tablets of human hearts, he tells the Corinthians. And he adds, since we have such a hope, act with great boldness, and tells them and us, for the love of Christ urges us on. And today, in his love, Christ invites us to open our hearts to his letter and invites us to receive his spirit so that we might be sent to those who have yet to hear and believe in him. A letter of grace and peace, of love and compassion, written on and through our own hearts. Grace, mercy and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen.